Hi everyone. Welcome to the Redan History Workshop. It's so nice to see so many of you here. Thanks for coming. Um, it's always really good to be in the company of people who are knowledgeable and connected to their community. So uh, as much as we've got some very interesting storytelling lined up for you. We're very keen to hear your input um, and, and share that knowledge amongst the group. Uh, so we have three very renowned and knowledgeable speakers lined up for you, um, of which I'm not one, so I'm not gonna go into any detail at all. Um, and forgive me if I introdu uh, introduce them from reading from the paper. I uh, expect if you're dealing with historians, you wanna make sure that your facts are correct. So I'll just read straight from the blurb that I have. Um, so, uh, we're going to record the event, so there might be a little bit of uh, technological goings on that we'll, we'll manage throughout, uh, but let's get started and introduce the lovely Doug Bradbury. So if you want to make your way up, Doug, I'll read a story for you. Thank you. So, born and bred at 503 Talbot Street, uh, Doug attended the Urquhart Street Primary School. Uh, he taught history for 30 years at Ball Ballarat Secondary Schools, uh, mainly at Ballarat North Tech. Uh, and then he spent over a decade at the Gold Museum at Sovereign Hill. Uh, his engaging and thought-provoking introduction to the gold fields was enjoyed by over 100 schools every year probably taught my children. Uh, Doug's family has been involved in mining in Ballarat since 1853. Uh, his grandfather, Daniel Bradbury, walked to Ballarat in 1858 as a 10 year old boy. His other grandpa, Arthur de Leyland, erected and dismantled the poppet heads of Ballarat mines. Doug's written seven books in the Seriously Weird History series, which continue Doug's passion for engaging people in reading, enjoying and reflecting upon the human story. And he's also written a number of books on Ballarat's history. So I will pass over and Doug will share his knowledge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Oh, goodness, I'm behind this thing. <laughs> there I am. Okay. Well, it's been a while since I've been on a stage in Redan. Um, I was 12 when I was last on a stage in Redan, and it wasn't good because <laughs> I was a magician in the school concert thing, and the pitcher of water. Uh, <laughs> hit the kid in the front row, <laughs> one of the bubs, and I still reckon to this day that they shouldn't have called the doctor, but um, the mother was insistent, but the child survived and lived happily ever after. I'm pretty sure we'll be right today. I'll just, I'll, I'll just make sure that there's nothing on the, that can hit anyone in the front row. Redan. Well, it's a subject that you can't define, isn't it? Because no one knows where the blooming boundaries are. Um, I'd certainly do if I go south, because the moment we cross the Rubicon, we're in Sebastopol. Um, but I don't know what the Redan schools must have floated down in a flood or something, because it's down there in Sebast. It's not actually in Redan itself. I don't know where Ballarat Central ends or where Ballarat South uh, ends or starts. I don't know what, where Newington begins or ends. But growing up here in the, in the 1950s, it felt like the 1850s was the way my grandparents talked to me all the time. Growing up here in the 1950s, I certainly knew where the centre of Redan was. And the centre of Redan, as far as I was concerned, was 503 Talbot Street. That's where I lived. My church was that way. My school was that way. My tram was that way. Um, what else have I got? I kicked the footy in the street out the front with my cousins, the Delayland boys. Um, this is my part of the world. I grew up at this part. If I really had to name the centre, and there's no commercial centre, is there? Uh, the main road that takes the traffic through Redan is on the edge rather than the middle, Skipton Street I'm referring to. Um, and there were corner shops everywhere, not a great cluster of them. There's a school there and a church there and the butchers there and the bakers somewhere else. So the whole darn thing seemed to be remarkably um, spread out for my childhood in the 1950s. The word itself, I always assumed that Redan was a, a place for the Crimean War, because this is 19, 1854, 55, 56. And what's going on at the time is the Crimean War. So if you were a wealthy miner and you had done very well on your mantelpiece in Redan in 1860 would have been that. Because here's the Turkish leader, here's five foot two of Queen Victoria, that's, uh, that's where she stopped, 
and this is Louis Napoleon, the, the French president, and these were the images of the Allies against the Russians in the Crimean War. Now, the Crimean War dominates in terms of names all over this place, doesn't it? So we've got Nightingale and Balaclava and Ripon and Ragland and Cardigan, Sebastopol. So I thought Redan must have been a, one of the places in, in that war. Not quite. Close. It's a corruption of the French word redoubt. The Allies attacked the big fort of Sebastopol and in front of the fort was the big redoubt, the barricade that you had to take before you could attack the city. They failed in the attack. So the redoubt, well, we can't say a French word. That's ridiculous. People like De Lalande, we have to say it as De Lalande. Um, so it soon got anglicised to Redan. So it's actually the barricade in front of Sebastopol. Um, yeah, not bad. <laughs> Central Ballarat. Redan in front of Sebastopol, Sebastopol down there over the other side of Rubicon Street. So that's where the word Redan comes from. The lead comes down, the underground river comes down, the Redan lead comes down uh, through Mount Pleasant, etc., uh, into about Bell Street and Lee Street. Uh, so in the 1950s growing up here, um, what have we got? Well, quite mixed. Um, the mines are gone, but you beauty, they left the world's best adventure playgrounds known to mankind. Uh, nothing like a car door and wet pine needles to slide down uh, the mullocks in the park and the, the Kohenor and uh, the Band of Hope, etc. You could, you know, you'd be in hospital by up past 10 of the morning, I tell you. Absolutely. They were fair dinkum adventure playgrounds. An adventure playground now is a place where you cannot be hurt. Well, that's a contradiction in terms, if you ask me. We had fair dinkum ones here. The quarries, and across the road there was a ripper, and they became tips and filled in. Uh, they were too scary for me. Uh, straight downside through that blue stone and water at the bottom, and you only have to have a little look and trove to see what happened in many of those, and it isn't good. So the quarries were finished as well, um, but they were still filling them in. During World War II, when the Americans left from the Victoria Park, all the stuff they didn't need, tables and chairs or whatever, were taken over and thrown in the tip, into, into the Tricardo tip across the road there in the park, and uh, local people came and pinched the stuff. Uh, they couldn't have uh, people pinching stuff that people had thrown away, so they put guards on the gate to make sure people pinched stuff that other people had thrown away, and that stopped that. So presumably there's a fair degree of American uh, leftover stuff that those poor boys didn't take to Guadalcanal or wherever it was that they were then uh, moved to after that. There were industries around. There were foundries and foundry hotels, etc. Um, as we certainly knew when the wind blew from the north, because that's where the skin shed was. So there was remnants of industry in the area. But basically, it was in the process of changing from, a, from an area that had been highly industrialised to an area that is what it is today, which is a tranquil, beautiful, tree-lined um, place with a grid laid out by Urquhart, 1851, and, of course, the contrast between East and West in Ballarat is just absolutely remarkable, isn't it? In Ballarat East, you've got those roads going all over the ruddy place, Humphrey Street and Gumtree Flat and Peel Street. I never know the name of the street I'm in when I'm in Ballarat East. I know where I am and how to get out, but I just don't know the name of the place. And what have we got in Ballarat West? We've got the whole thing laid out grid pattern. And that's because when Urquhart laid it out, in his view, the mining, well, this is a perfect example of it here, the mining and the muck and the mullock can be down there in Bridge Mall and Bridge Street and the gravel pits and uh, down in Ballarat East, and the township and the good pubs and the banks and the um, doctors and lawyers, we can be up here in Ballarat West. So Ballarat has uh, got two very, very, very distinct like a tree, you know, that's got grows one sort of apple on one side and one sort of another sort of apple on the other side. It is the same golf field. It is the same golf field, but it's two totally different styles of mining, and produce to two totally different sets of places. 
Let me tell you the importance of, of Redan in Ballarat's mining history. Now, let's see. That map, now you only need to see it generally. It's over there and over there and over there and over there. So I bought about five copies of this map so that you can go and ask that terrible question, am I living on the top of a mine shaft? Well, their maps of Ballarat overlaid by the mining. OK? So you can have a look and see whether you are actually living on the top of the ventilation shaft of the Band of Hope or whatever the case may be. Ballarat's mining. Um, I do write books, they're over there, and I'll talk to you about them a bit later on. Um, when I was talking to a group, a Probus group, there was a lady in the group who was not happy. You could see the longer my talk went on, the more <laughs> uptight she was getting. And when the talk had finished, she came straight up and said, you do know that Bendigo was bigger, don't you? <laughs> and I said, I do know that Bendigo was a bigger gold field, but Ballarat is more interesting, more complex, and more important. <laughs> she did not buy a book. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but let me explain to you why I was quite prepared to take this woman on for as many hours as she had to spare. And that is because in Bendigo they get a rock and they bash it. It's rock mining, quartz mining. They got 22 million ounces of that. In Castlemaine, it's basically surfacing. It's on the surface or not far below it. You're picking it up. Mother Nature has done the right thing by the Castlemaine people, got it out of the rock, weathering, hot and cold, and just left it there on the ground for you to pick up. And that's what happened in Ballarat as well. It's alluvial gold. It's been got out of the rock come down the hill and sat at the bottom of the hill. But there's an unbelievable, incredible complication about Ballarat that made Ballarat stretch out democratic implications and produce a, a, a unique city. And that is, when it came down the hill and got in those rivers at the bottom, those rivers are buried. So Ballarat consists of 37 kilometres of buried rivers. OK? And in those 37 kilometres of buried rivers, they got 10 million ounces of gold in 20 years. It's 2,500 an ounce today. I'm telling you, they got $25 billion worth of wealth. Ordinary people. Was this owned by London investors or Sydney people or no? It was owned and won by the people who dug it by the pick and shovel people that dug it. They're not company mines. When Barclay, the great governor, was brought here in 1858 to Lydiate Street and they showed him the greatest mine, the old gravel pit mine, right on Chancery Lane in Lydiate Street South. And the governor, he's about seven foot high, um, said, oh, who owns this? We do, sir. Pardon? The pump, it's 800 pound. Uh, how did you get that? Oh, we bought it. Beg your pardon? <laughs> and that's because these men had won the wealth of Ballarat East. Most of that had been won from 51 to 56 in Ballarat East. I'm going for a little walk now, so if, if I disappear, I'm just going to be pointing. It's found there at the base of uh, Sovereign Hill, the Canadian. This is where the monster nuggets are. You're 60 foot deep, you're 80 foot deep. This is a buried river. It's under Main Road as you travel from Ballarat to Buninyong. You get under Bridge Mall, you're 200 feet deep. Three cricket pitches in, you know, converted into real language. You're out three cricket pitches deep. It's a flowing river. You are working it 24 hours a day or you drown. No, no good coming back at 8 o'clock next morning looking for it. It will be filled with water. And then, and this is the interesting bit for Redanites, it hit this brick wall. The whole of Ballarat West. And we can see it by simply looking out the window, is one great big long plateau. From the west until you hit the escarpment, Dana Street, Sturt Street, White Flat, the Redan wetlands, right down to Magpie. There's an edge, the escarpment. And what you're on here is this plateau. 
it's a lava flow. If we get out and try and dig a, a mine out there, you'll find out it's a lava flow. This is basalt. <laughs> you'll find out what it is, and you can forget your pick and shovel. You better start finding some more complicated stuff to do. So Ballarat West, Redan, Sebastopol, is about finding gold that is under, in a buried river, five lava flows down. Technically, it's incredible. And this was done by those men themselves. Not by geologists, not by mm, uh, government investigation or something, but by bit by bit men talking to each other and working this pattern out. So Ballarat West, Sebastopol, let's say five million ounces. We'll give the Sebastopol oaks about half of it. I reckon about two and a half million ounces here in Redan, and 2,500 an ounce, I'm telling you that they got about six billion dollars worth of gold. Now in Ballarat East, you're going down 60 feet. It's worked on the hit and miss system. So let's say this is a mining party here, and they sink, and they get nothing. They hit the bedrock where the old seabed was, no gravel, no gold, nothing. This mob, they've hit a little bit of gold. They're making tucker. They're not doing too bad. They've hit the river bank. This mob have hit the river bed. They have got the low point where all that gold has been collected by Mother Nature for millions of years, and they are extremely rich. They have hit the golden point gutter. The main gutter that flows down through, Bal through Ballarat West and Redan is the golden point gutter. Joining it are these gullies that are coming down off the White Horse. They go under the Yarrawee. Absolutely amazing. At 90 degrees and you've got men mining under it. Isambard Kingdom Brunel was having trouble with this sort of stuff in London in, in 1840. Ballarat miners were doing this in 1858 here. Then, then let's come down from central Ballarat. We'll start at Dana Street, the Waterloo lead. Go down a bit further, the Nightingale, and then the Malakoff, the Milkmaid, the Mount Pleasant, the Miner's Right, the Redan, the Frenchman's. There's 11 of them, all coming down off that White Horse Range, all going into this great big gutter that is under Ballarat and under Redan, under Ballarat West. Now, even from where you're sitting with your binoculars, you should be able to see but in Ballarat East, the river is behaving like a river, a little bit snake-like, but fairly predictable. Look what happens when it hits Redan. It goes nuts. It's doing right-hand turns. It turns left down Lydiard Street, right up uh, um, uh, Dana Street, left again, and then down behind Talbot Street, then and left and then back a bit. It's incredibly difficult. A, you've got to get down there, B, you've got to find it, then you've got to have the, the means to lift men, gravel and water from 300, 100 metres down. You've got to have hellish power. This is beyond, you're not standing there with a ruddy windlass, are you? This is well and truly beyond it. Sovereign Hill is wonderful. It shows you everything that happened in Ballarat East. It tells you nothing. There's nothing about under the basalt. There's nothing about Redan and Sebastopol's story. There's nothing about how that was the great penetration that caused it. So in terms of my books, they discover it, the story of Ballarat East. And this is the story of Redan. This is a bit more complicated and it's a bit thicker and it's a bit harder to explain. But these are the blokes thinking it through and thinking it through. And in 20 years, all of that gravel has been taken out. All of that had been examined, the gold extracted from it, and that's the end of the, that system. And then Ballarat had to be survived. Something had to happen to keep Ballarat going. Somebody had to say, well, where the hell does it come from? Well, it comes out of quartz. Bendigo's finding it in the quartz. Perhaps we could. Now, where did that breakthrough occur? Well, it occurred at a number of places. The Temperance Mine at Little Bendigo, the Land Barris, the New Imperial, 
but to get a line of quartz. You don't want one mine. You want one mine that leads to another mine, that leads to another mine, that leads to another mine. Where the hell do you reckon that happened? Good old Rodin. Okay? That's where that occurred. It occurred basically in the new Coenor, opposite Barry James. The one up the road was the, the Washington. Fabulous bloke in charge, William Barton. And then as you go further down the line, you would then hit the big mines of Sebas uh, and Redan, the Band of Hope, the South Star and the Star of the East, etc. So Bal Redan played that crucial role. The 1870s Ballarat was dead on its feet. It was just in terrible trouble. For a whole decade, the Ballarat just went into terminal decline and it was saved by Redan because they got their way into that quartz and got another 40 years of mining. Not at the spectacular level. It ain't 1850, you know, we're not finding the welcome nugget here, but we've got 2,500 blokes getting a wage every Friday. And 2,500 blokes going down to Bridge Street to spend it is a lot of prosperity. It certainly kept going for that long period of time. Something else happened weird in Ballarat. Once they got to that stable stage with the mining, they couldn't get any more. So what would you do with your sons? You're 45-year-old, you've got an 18-year-old who would, wants to pick and shovel in the mine. You've got a 22-year-old who's just done his course at the SMB. Let him knock on the door at the Star of the East or the Kohanor and see whether he can get a job. No hope. What's he do? Kalgoorlie. Overwhelmingly, Cornwall had given us their sons, their ability, their skills, and that built Ballarat. They're Cornish miners that do this. Now, Ballarat does the same thing for Broken Hill, for Mount Isa, for, Gal for Kalgoorlie. I was telling the group yesterday that um, I was looking up a mine that said the Ballarat North Mine. Oh, I couldn't find it on either of any maps. I looked and looked and looked. No, couldn't find it marked. Ballarat North, perhaps they meant Creswick. Um, yep, I found it. Broken Hill. <laughs> Ballarat Miners with a sense of humour. Ballarat Miners. But what the impact of that was that every goldfield is male dominated at first. If you walk down Main Road in 1858 and walk past eight adults, you would find seven of them male, right? Seven out of eight. In 1900, adults, there are 11,000 males, 13,500 females. We'd lost our young men. Our young men had gone to other gold fields. And I will put my money on this, that Ballarat West was the first gold field in the world where the majority of people on that gold field were women. Brave John Madden. Madden received one of the first uh, medallions from the Royal Humane Society. In the Star of the East, blasting went wrong and his mate was bleeding to death. He's blinded, he follows the line down to the main shaft, he gets help for his mate. He receives a medallion uh, they raise £116 for him in Ballarat and they buy him a house. They have £5.18 and sixpence left after they paid the first year's fire insurance for him. They gave him the £5.18 and sixpence. Administrative costs? Zero. Nothing. Brave John Madden. Um, go around the corner and we'll find at 416 Erid Street Robert Carroll. Now, for 47 years, he did not miss a Sunday. He was superintendent of the Bubs at the Wesleyan Sunday School at the top of the Dana Street Hill. There were a 1,000 children in that Sunday school, and that school was so important in the minds of those people at the time that the mayor of Ballarat, J.A. Doan, who did, was one of our famous architects, he was the superintendent of the seniors. There was another bloke in charge of the middle lot. And this guy, Robert Carroll, 
He was in charge of the bubs. Nobody wants the bubs. Who wants 300 kids of a Sunday morning? <laughs> but he had them, and he had them for 47 years, and he did not miss a Sunday. And when they thanked him in 1903, he, they brought him up to give the speech, and he couldn't speak, and he was overwhelmed. And there was 800 people, and the mayor and everybody was there saying that he was terrific. OK, so that's good service. But there's one other thing you need to know about Robert Carroll. Uh, Robert Carroll's parents were Jamaican slaves. <laughs> Absolutely remarkable. Absolutely incredible. That bloke had an honoured position in this community for 47 years. What's more precious than your five-year-old child? I can't think of anything. And thousands of them were educated by that man. Mercy. And as Ballarat honoured this fellow. Right, the oddity. What's the funniest or the... Not the funniest. What's the strangest thing that I have found about this part of the world? Well, you might know it, but this place played a remarkably important role in Ballarat's aviation history. The first plane to land and take off from Ballarat. Well, I think it was by Wizard Stone. Wizard was his stage name, because they were more typewriter captors, weren't they, than anything. He's here in 1912. The, truck, the plane is bought here on a jinker, so he doesn't fly in, of course. It's taken to the City Oval. <laughs> 2,000 people pay to come in to have a look at him. They take it down to the southeast corner <laughs> uh, point post. They line her up across there, and away they go. <laughs> and halfway across the City Oval, he goes, geez, we're not going to make it. We're not going to get over those trees at the other end of this. And they stop the engine. They then try to start the engine. <laughs> they can't start the engine. So it's put on the jinker and it's taken to a slightly bigger runway. Well, I called mine as race course. They called it Redan race course. Not the squatters race course, the miners race course. Um, Bray Raceway. OK, now, so they carted it down there and he took off and he did a circuit of the blooming thing at about 40 foot high of the miners' race course, and he landed. Wrote a letter to the courier saying, I'm terribly sorry about what happened last week. I'll make another go at the City Oval next Saturday. And he had another go at the City Oval next Saturday and hit the tree and stayed in the base hospital for the next month. <laughs> so, not so good. In 1928, Bertie Hinkler came to Ballarat, another famous Australian aviator, with Mrs Hinkler. So they're over the City Oval, and he's the half-time entertainment. There's half-time entertainment. They would have this in the middle of the MCG. So down he comes, and he's going to land. Um, all the blokes have pulled off, and the game has started halfway through the second quarter. And he takes a look at it and says, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> I don't think there's enough room to move. <laughs> so they land, and he flies down to the Bray Raceway, the Miners Race Course, and he is followed by about half the people of Redan who go down there, including my brothers and sisters and mum and dad. And in they go to see it. I wasn't born at the time, so this is just a family story. And uh, Bertie Hinkler and his wife land safely. Um, and then a small tragedy. Rover the dog got lost. Dad lost the family dog. And he was blamed most bitterly over this matter. And he claimed that Bertie Hinkler had stolen the dog and the family would go out on the veranda every time a plane flew over and Jack and Dawn and Max would wave to Bertie Hinkler and Rover the dog who were leaving the area. <laughs> they did eventually build the aerodrome, didn't they? And Amy Johnson came here. Um, what's his name? Charles Kingsford Smith came here. We had the record, Ballarat. Um, he wouldn't take uh, an official lunch because he said, I'm here on private business. It's just I'm charging people to fly in the Southern Cross. So his plane, the Southern Cross, came here. And they, it took 12 people each time. So, you know, they'd stick 12 in it. Off they'd go. Eight minutes. Down. Next. Down. Down. And the record was Ballarat. We had more than anybody else. He did 42 flights one afternoon. 42 flights. So I make that about... Um, 500 Ballarat people who have been in the Southern Cross, flown over this town by um, Kingsford Smith. Absolutely fantastic. Monash has been here, 
the Queen, of course, cut has been here to Ascot Street. Um, Queen Victoria's sons have been here. Um, people like John Madden and Robert Carroll. And let me end by just saying, what can we do here? Where is it? What has Ballarat, what has Redan ever done for Ballarat? <laughs> um, I can't think of anything. Oh, apart from the base prosperity, oh, apart from the bluestone that built half of the blasted place, uh, particularly in the centre and on the roads, a hell of a lot better than what they were previously using. They were, they were using the courts broken up for roads. You can imagine how many punctures that gave you. That was fabulous. Um, the two, perhaps the two greatest institutions of Ballarat that's got Ballarat's thumbprint on it really, really magnificently is the Beneb, as I would refer to it as, Ballarat Redan, and South Street competitions. And you've got no idea of the size of South Street in 1914. World War I, when it was declared, three weeks later, where was the Prime Minister of Australia? Sorting out the Dardanelles? And, no, 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 he's in Ballarat opening the South Street competition. When Billy Hughes was chucked out of the Labor Party, where was he? In Sydney fighting it out with his um, political... No, no, he's in Ballarat opening the um, <laughs> South Street. And, you know, the Roaring Twenties, where was uh, Stanley Melbourne Bruce? Oh, he's in Ballarat opening South Street. The Prime Minister came to this place to open South Street. That's how important South Street was in the history of this nation for about 20 years and so. Dame Nellie Melba kept making comebacks <laughs> to, uh, to South Street. It's a glorious suburb. It's got trees, it's got the corner stores, it's got schools, it's got churches, it's got a fabulous story. And most importantly, of course, um, I reckon what Ballarat has done, it provided my home, my church, my school, my friends, my street, my tram, my community. Thank you.